This morning we are in Matthew 27 as we continue our study through the Gospel of Matthew. Um, some of you have heard, you know, once we finish Matthew, we're going to start the book of Revelation. So be in prayer for that. A lot of things going on in the world around us, obviously. But we are looking at Jesus, his final, he's, you know, right now, just hours away from being put on the cross. Uh, he's been betrayed by Judas Iscariot when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the soldiers beat him. Uh, he went to Annas, the high priest, the former high priest first. Then he goes to Caiaphas, the current high priest. Then he goes to uh, Pontius Pilate. And then he goes to Herod, King Herod. Then he goes back to Pontius Pilate. So overall, there's six different trials that Jesus is going to. And uh, we're going to look at primarily the last one here in a moment. But, um, you know, Jesus was silent through this whole time. He wasn't answering their questions until Caiaphas put him under oath. And he says, tell us by the living God. And he says, I'm putting you under oath. And so according to the Leviticus, you had to respond if you were put under this oath. And so he said, tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, it is as you said, I am. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he is just confirmed. He is God the Son, the Son of God, as the Son of Man. He is also, you know, the one that was prophesied about in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. So that's when Caiaphas tears his robe and the other religious leaders say, you know, he is guilty. He has spoken blasphemy. You've heard his blasphemy. And they all agree, he is deserving of death. And, and once again, blasphemy is when you claim to be God or you claim to be equal with God. Well, you know, Jesus, if he wasn't God, yes, he would be committing blasphemy. But because he is God, it's not blasphemy. He's speaking the truth. And so they've already made up their minds. They want to kill him. So we got through chapter 26 last time. And um, it ended with Peter denying the Lord three times. And as he's denying the Lord, we saw in Luke's gospel that as soon as he denies the Lord, Jesus is coming out of Caiaphas' residence, and their eyes meet, Peter and Jesus. And that's when the rooster crows, and Peter runs away weeping and sobbing, the one who was so arrogant and so proud, saying, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you, and cock a doodle do. So that was the way that chapter ended. So we'll pick up in chapter 27. Verse 1, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we are so blessed uh, just to be able to gather together to worship you, to spend time in your word, to encourage and build each other up in the faith. Lord, we pray that you continue to have your hand upon Chuck. We don't know uh, all that's going on there. You know he's in your hands, and we thank you, Lord, that he has walked with you for 50 years plus. So uh, we know that he belongs to you, and whatever you uh, have for him, Lord, we know that, uh, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with you, and oh, what glory to be in your presence. But to uh, keep him here uh, for whatever you have for him here, Lord, we thank you for that as well. Uh, we just commit them into your hands and pray that you would be blessed and glorified through this whole thing. And that many of his family members that don't know you, that they would see your mighty hand at work upon uh, their uncle, their brother, their friend. And so, Lord, we just commit Chuck into your hands and pray that you would comfort Anita and just give her strength for whatever lies ahead. And so, Father, we just... Uh, commit this time to you and pray that you be blessed and glorified as we spend this time in your living word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So it was interesting when I was at the hospital yesterday, uh, and for a lot of the time, Anita was taking phone calls from different relatives and then put the phone up to Chuck's ear and say, he can't respond. And so in the, she's on speakerphone. So everybody's saying, oh, Uncle Chuck, oh, Chuck, we love you. And, and it was just saying their goodbyes. People were coming up to the house saying their goodbyes. Well, maybe it's not saying goodbye yet, so we'll have to see. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing, so whatever God wants to do. Chapter 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. Again, this is the third trial. It says, when morning came. This is when 
the, the first official trial took place because the first two were at night, and that was illegal. And so now they got the whole Sanhedrin together. This would be 70 members, uh, you know, the rabbinical leaders, the chief priests, the scribes. There's 70 plus the high priest, so 71 members of the Sanhedrin are standing there before Jesus. And the, uh, this is just a formality because, again, they've already determined in their hearts he's guilty. He deserves to die. But what we saw last week, uh, the Romans had taken away Israel's right to execute someone. And so they have to try and persuade Pontius Pilate that Jesus is deserving of death. I, again, this is all part of God's plan. This is the whole reason why Jesus left heaven and came to earth. God, you know, came from heaven to earth took on a human body, but it was for the purpose of dying on the cross for the sins of the world. So he had to do this. Every time I read through this section, I'm like, oh, man, this is so sad. Jesus, just get him, you know. But good thing he didn't just get him because he could have called 72,000 angels, 12 legions of angels to come to his rescue, but he didn't because he knew this is what he had to do. He had to die. According to King David in Psalm 22, he had to be crucified. And David wrote that a thousand years before this scene. He wrote it hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented. Now, Matthew doesn't give us any details about what happened when Jesus stood before the entire Sanhedrin. It just mentions it this morning. He goes before them. But this is what we see in Luke 22, starting in verse 66. Doc, uh, Dr. Luke fills in some details. It says, As soon as it was day... The elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. If I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And that leads us to verse 2, where it says, And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So this will be his fourth trial. Again, Matthew doesn't go into any details, but we have a very short exchange with um, Pontius Pilate and Jesus at this point, found in Luke 23, verses 2 through 4. It says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. And then they say, Jesus, uh, 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 say of Jesus, he's stirring up the people. And he started, you know, in Galilee. And as soon as Pilate hears, oh, he's from Galilee, well, that's King Herod's jurisdiction. Herod just happens to be in Jerusalem. And so he'll send him over to Herod, and that'll be his fifth trial. We know that Jesus didn't answer Herod at all. Herod's the one that put John the Baptist to death. He wanted Jesus to perform some signs and wonders for him, and Jesus didn't say a word to him. And so Herod will send him back to Pontius Pilate, and that is what we see here as we go through this chapter. But starting here in verse 3, we have the only picture, the only scene of what happens with Judas Iscariot. Look at verse 3 here. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful, and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. So here we see Judas. He's filled with remorse. He recognizes he's betrayed innocent blood. By the way, Jesus' blood is the only innocent blood there is, ever has been. Adam and Eve were created perfect, but when they sinned, their blood, their whole being was tainted with sin. So, Jesus was sinless in every way, but Judas was remorseful, it says here. That is not the same as repentance. A lot of people in jail and prison have remorse. I'm really sorry I got caught. 
Repentance means I'm sorry I did this and I turn away from this. I'm going to start doing things God's way. Our prisons are full of people with remorse. Now, this would be the main difference between Judas and Peter. Peter denied the Lord three times. That's a big sin. You know, he ran away weeping bitterly. But Peter repented, and Jesus restored Peter. And, you know, God would use Peter in tremendous ways in the future. When you compare, you know, Peter and Judas' life, Peter really believed who Jesus Christ was and is. Judas wanted to make Jesus into something he wanted Jesus to be. He wanted Jesus. I think the reason he betrayed Jesus here is because he's trying to make Jesus come against the enemies of Israel. He's trying to force Jesus to step up and be the Messiah and wipe out our enemies. But it all backfired because he did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who's going to die for the sins of the world. Now, look how callous these chief priests were here. It says, when Judas says, I've betrayed innocent blood, their attitude is, well, what's that to us? In other words, we don't care about you or your feelings. We gave you 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus, and you did. So if you have, you know, sadness now, you feel bad about it now, well, that's your problem. That's not our problem. And, and so they're just totally indifferent to Judas. But this is so much like Satan. He'll, he'll draw people down this path thinking, oh, this is so wonderful. This is so glamorous. This is so enticing. But then he pulls the rug out from under your feet, and down you go. And that's exactly what happens with Judas. So look at verse 5. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. What a sad verse. Now, first of all, it says Judas threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple. The Greek word for temple here is naos, which means it's in the inner part of the temple. Not the Holy of Holies, but it's in the holy place within the temple itself. Nobody was to be in there except for the uh, high priests and the Levites. And it just shows us how corrupt these guys are, letting Judas into the naos. And so this just shows that these guys were just breaking every law that they had ever come up with. But then it says that Judas went out and hanged himself. Again, this is not mentioned in the other Gospels, but it is mentioned in the book of Acts in chapter 1. Look at these verses starting in verse 16. This is when Peter is uh, speaking about replacing Judas, one of the twelve apostles, with someone else. It says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong... Oh, this is always wonderful before lunch. He burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. So apparently Judas hung himself. That's what we're told here in Matthew. But then, you know, people say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. No, there's a lot of cliffs right around that area in Jerusalem. He probably hung himself in a tree and either the branch broke and he fell and burst open or they let him hang there for a while and he fell and burst. Either way, it was nasty. His corpse rotted and he died. But look how hypocritical these priests are in verse 6. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. These are the same guys that had just beaten Jesus. They just brought in false witnesses against Jesus. They've just done all these horrible things to Jesus. And now they're concerned about 30 pieces of silver that they gave Judas to betray Jesus. Well, it's not lawful for us to put this back in the treasury, so this is the price of blood. I mean, their hypocrisy is unbelievable. So verse 7, they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. In Acts chapter 1, this potter's field is called Akeldama, it just means field of blood. And it's called the potter's field because there's kind of a different opinion. Some say broken pottery was thrown out there. 
Others, when I leaned towards, it was an area where there was good soil, clay, where potters would gather their clay to make all their pottery. But either way, here's a, a thought. The blood money for Jesus was used to buy this field because they said we're going to bury dead bodies there. Strangers are going to be buried there. Good soil for that, I guess? I don't know. But it's the blood of Jesus that purchases us. And here it's a field of blood. It'll be Jesus' blood. But we're like clay pots. You know, he goes to the potter's field, he scrapes us up, and he molds us and shapes us into some vessel of honor for his glory. We who are dead in our sins, he's brought to life. We were strangers and aliens. Paul says it like this in Ephesians 2, verses 12 to 13, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So a neat picture. He was a field of blood to bury strangers in. And now by his blood, us strangers have been brought into the body of Christ. Verse 9. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who is priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. So this seems to be a pretty straightforward quote from the Old Testament. Matthew says this was fulfilled, or this fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecy. Critics of the Bible like to say, well, see, here's an error because, and they're right when they say this, that Jeremiah didn't give this prophecy. It's actually a prophecy found in Zechariah chapter 11. That's the quote here. And so they try to say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. The Jews had three sections to the Old Testament. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, and then all the writings, which would include Psalms and all the other writings. Jesus breaks it down like this in Luke 24, verse 44. This is after he rises from the dead, and he's talking to the two guys on the road to Emmaus. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses. There, there's book one. The Prophets, book two. And the Psalms concerning me, that's book three. So when it came to the book of the Prophets, Jeremiah is always listed first. And so many of them referred to that whole list of prophets as the book of Jeremiah. So that's all he's referring to. He's not contradicting Zechariah. All Matthew is saying, this is in that comp compila compilation. Does that sound right? Anne, help me out here. You're the English person. Okay, compilation. Yeah. So anyway, collectively it's referred to as the Jeremiah the prophet. Be that as it may, we now come to the sixth and final trial of Jesus. And this is the big one because... The Jews come before Pontius Pilate. Jesus will be before, before Pilate. Jesus is before all the multitudes of people. And so it says here in verse 11, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. So we know Pontius Pilate is not a happy camper at this moment. He is not, you know, he did not want to be in the middle of this whole dispute between the Jews and Jesus. I mean, he was trying to avoid this as much as he could. Uh, we'll see things get really ugly, and he'll get even more freaked out when they say, oh, we want him dead. And then Pilate understands what their motive is for bringing Jesus to him. Look at these verses in John chapter 18, starting in verse 29. We get a little fuller picture here. It says, Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what 
death he would die. He'd been telling the disciples over and over again he was going to be crucified in Jerusalem, you know, buried and then rise again the third day. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, again, he's starting to realize all these trumped up charges against Jesus are because they want me to send him to death. And he didn't want to do this. So he rushes back into the praetorium. He questions Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? I mean, he asked him like, four or five times. Are you the king? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Again, four or five times he tells them, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. There's no fault in him. There's, I don't have nothing against this guy. But it's interesting because Pilate says, what is truth? But he doesn't stick around to hear the answer. Because Jesus could have just quoted what he said in John 14, 6. I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He could have said, you know, like he prayed there in John 17, 17, when he's praying to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. The pilot just, what is truth? And he gets out of there. He doesn't ever listen to the answer. So, at this point, Pilate knew that Jesus committed no crime whatsoever. He knows Jesus does not deserve death. Now, as we just saw in Matthew, Pilate marveled greatly that Jesus remained silent as all the Jews are accusing him of all these different things. But even that is fulfilling prophecy. Remember in uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7, it says of Jesus, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So here, Pilate is caught between a rock and a hard place because he already has three strikes against him. There's been three various Jewish uprisings during Pilate's governorship here in Israel, and Tiberius Caesar had already told him, if there's one more, you're out of here. You're, you're basically, he's going to get fired. And so he doesn't want to see an uprising among the, you know, the Jewish people here. He's already saying Jesus is innocent. He repeatedly says, I find no fault in him. In a moment, he says, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. But little, little did uh, Pilate realize that his name would be uh, immortalized in the Apostles' Creed, where it says he was Jesus crucified under Pontius Pilate. And so he's looking for a way out of this situation. So look at verse 15. Now, at the feast, this is Passover, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. Now, somewhere along the line, this tradition started during Passover that the Jews could request Pilate release a prisoner, probably a political prisoner, probably somebody that was you know, defending Israel, a rebel against the Roman Empire, somebody that was popular with the people. And so, verse 16, and at that time they had, no, uh, had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Why was Barabbas notorious? Well, when you look at Mark, Luke, and John, it says of Barabbas he was a robber, he was a rebel, and he was a murderer. He was a rebel against Rome. It sounds like a description Jesus gives us of Satan, Barabbas. John 10, verse 10. 
of Satan, Jesus says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But this is why Jesus came. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Look at verse 17. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. So Pilate thinks that his offer to release one of these two men, he's thinking it's going to be an easy choice. He knows the religious leaders, they want Jesus dead. But he's also thinking the multitudes love Jesus. It was only five days earlier Jesus is riding on the donkey into Jerusalem, and everybody's there. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, save us now. And everybody's excited about Jesus. And so Pilate puts this question before the people, and he's thinking, Surely they're going to want, want Jesus released. Pilate wasn't threatened by Jesus. Jesus was a man of peace. He wasn't stirring up crowds to rebel against Rome. Be that as it may, he says here, and I can picture Jesus on one side of Pilate and Barabbas on the other side. He says, so which of these two men do you want me to set free, Jesus or Barabbas? Now, I've always been amazed at this scene here because you got Barabbas. What does his name mean? Well, Bar means son of, like Simon Bar-Jonah. That's Peter's name, Simon, son of Jonah. So you got Barabbas. Son of Abbas is the father. Barabbas, son of the father. Well, the father of lies, you might say. Here's Jesus, the son of the father. So who do you want? This political son of the father? Or do you want Jesus, the true son of the father? Very important question. Jesus is a prisoner because he healed and saved people's lives. Barabbas is a prisoner because he stole and killed people. It's absolutely amazing to me how God put these two men before the people. He gives them a choice. Who do you want to be part of your life from now on? As you know, they will choose the sinful worldly guy, Barabbas. But that's what people wanted back then. And that's what people want today, a political leader who will help us overthrow our oppressors, a political leader, a person like Barabbas. But what we all need, who we all need, is Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, the Son of God the Father, the one who loves us, the one who wants to save us, the one who wants to wash all of our sins away. This is exactly the same choice people will have to make now, But even after the rapture of the church, when we're gone, people are going to have to make a choice. Are you going to choose Jesus Christ or are you going to choose the Antichrist? The substitute, son of the father, father of lies, or the son of the father, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Jesus says this in John chapter 5, verse 43, I have come in my father's name, And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. You know, as we saw in Matthew 24, Jesus over and over again talks, warns about false teachers, false prophets. Beware. We need to follow Jesus Christ, him only. So look at verse 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife went uh, sent to him saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So how bizarre is this? Pilate's wife probably just woke up, because this is around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Jesus will go on to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. So she wakes up having this crazy dream, and then she probably hears this commotion out there, you know, big crowd, Jesus there, and then she calls for her husband, Pilate, I just had this dream. Have nothing to do with this just man. I'm sure Pilate's now getting even more worked up. Like, oh, no, have nothing to do with this just man. I kind of wonder what her dream was. That'd be interesting. We know God gives dreams, even unbelievers. Think of Pharaoh during the time of Joseph. 
Remember, Pharaoh had the dream. Nobody can interpret it. So Joseph goes to him and tells him this is the dream about the famine. So Joseph gets promoted and so forth. King Nebuchadnezzar, very pagan man at the time. He has these dreams, calls for Daniel. Daniel interprets the dreams to him. So be that as it may, the Greeks, the Romans, very superstitious people. And so his wife saying, I've had this dream, have nothing to do with this just man. I'm sure Pilate's really starting to freak out now. He doesn't want Jesus to die. But the chief priest, verse 20, and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So we see them persuading the multitudes. Again, it makes me wonder, what are these religious leaders saying? How are they persuading all these multitudes five days earlier, praising Jesus, and now they're persuading them to come against Jesus? At the same time, what do you think is going through the mind of Barabbas here? He was guilty. He was a robber. He was a rebel. He was a murderer. Many scholars that I've studied this out, many of them believe that that middle cross between the two thieves was Barabbas' cross. And he was going to be put on that cross. So he would have known very quickly here, well, this guy, Jesus, he's going to die in my place. He's going to be beaten and whipped in my place. He's going to be crucified to a cross that was meant for me. I wonder what kind of impact that had on him. Barabbas is going to be set free. Well, Jesus is going to go to the cross in his place. Makes me wonder, did Barabbas stick around and, and watch Jesus, you know, being beaten and nailed to the cross? Did he hear Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Was he hanging around when, you know, the sky from noon to three, it says, got black and then... Was he around? Because when Jesus gave up his spirit and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, then it says there's a massive earthquake there. Did he feel that? Or did Barabbas just like, I'm free, and just bolt and leave and go on with his re rebellion, live in his sin? We don't know. There's no history about Barabbas after this. But what a tragedy it would be if he just ran off and continued his life of sin and rebellion knowing that Jesus was his substitute. Because Barabbas is like all of us. In a lot, we're the guilty ones. We deserve to be on the cross, but Jesus went there in our place. So look at verse 21. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas, son of the father. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. This question that Pilate asks is really the most important question you, you, anybody could ask. What shall I do with Jesus who's called the Christ? That's really what it all boils down to. What are you going to do with Jesus? Remember back in Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they say, oh, some say you're Jeremiah the prophet, some Elijah, some John the Baptist. So then in Matthew 16, verse 15, he says to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ding, ding, ding. That's the correct answer, Peter. And he probably thought pretty good of himself. But then a few moments later, you can't go to the cross and die. And Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. Be careful. Don't let pride enter in. But that's really the big question here is, who is Jesus? Uh, what are you going to do with Jesus? When you're introduced to the Jesus of the Bible, what are you going to do with him? You're going to say, crucify him. He's nothing. He's worthless to me. Or are you going to worship him? Because he is God come in human flesh. Who is Jesus? Well, your eternal destiny hangs on that answer. Unfortunately, these Jewish people make the mistake of rejecting Jesus at this moment. But it's not the end of the story because many of these same Jews, 50 days later, so this is the day of Passover, 50 days later is the day of Pentecost. Peter is preaching and Peter is saying to these, a lot of these same people, you nailed him, to the innocent one, you nailed him to the cross. And then it says they were cut to the heart. What should we do? And Peter tells him, you need to repent. You need to give your life to Christ. And 3,000 Jews get saved. 
So it's not the end of the story, but this is where we need to be very careful about placing blame on the Jews, you know, because they're saying crucify him. It wasn't just the Jews that put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't just the Romans, because they actually are the ones that drove the nails into his hands and feet. Pilate, working for the Roman government, he's the one that sentenced him to his final death. We can't blame the Jews or the Romans, because if you want to look in the mirror, you could rightly say, I'm guilty of putting Jesus on the cross, because it was my sins and your sins that he went to the cross. It's because of his great love for us that he stayed on the cross and he allowed himself to be beaten and tortured and nailed to that cross in our place. It was his love for us that kept him on the cross. Again, this is why anti-Semitism is so wrong because the Jews are no more responsible for the death of Jesus than you and I are. And there's a lot of people that will use this verse in the next couple of verses to try to say, see, it's the Jews. And Hitler used this against the Jews. So-called Christians in the past tried to persecute Jews because of these verses. So wrong. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says this. Speaking of Jesus, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In other words, Jesus is, propitiation means the satisfaction of God's wrath. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God because God's wrath is poured out upon all those who die in their sins. Jesus died for our sins. And so he satisfied the wrath that you and I deserve. We're the guilty ones. We're the ones that rebelled against the Lord. We're the ones that sinned against the Lord. And so the Father dumped on Jesus as he's hanging on the cross all that we deserve. So he became the satisfaction for God's wrath in our place. And he says, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In other words, anybody can get saved. He's not saying everybody's going to get saved. He's saying anybody can. doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. doesn't matter how wicked you've been. If you will humble yourself and you'll call out to the Lord and you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, he'll forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. That's why it's called the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, look at verse 23. We'll wrap it up here in a moment. It says, Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, this uprising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. We know from the other Gospels, he sent Jesus to be scourged. And then they bring him back to Pilate. And then they'll throw this robe around him. And then he'll say, Behold the man. And, and again, he's trying to give the people one last chance. Look what I've done to your so-called Messiah. He's beaten. He's been scourged. Jesus is barely alive at this point. He's thinking their lust for blood has got to be satisfied at this point. And they'll still say crucify him. So Matthew doesn't cover that. He just says after he was scourged, they led him to be crucified. Scourging was one of the worst punishments of all time. It was often deadly to people that were being scourged. They would use the flagellum, and history talks all about this. It's a short-handled whip. It had nine leather straps coming off of it. Often it was called the cat of nine tails. And they would take the leather straps and tie in pieces of bone, metal, you know, sharp rocks, and they would use that across somebody's back. They'd, they'd tie them against a, uh, some kind of a pillar, maybe a tree or, you know, just a Roman pillar. They'd tie them there. They'd take their clothes off, their backs exposed, and they begin just to beat their back. If you confessed your sin, your crime, if you, you know, accused others of being involved in this crime with you, then they would stop. Jesus didn't say a word. I mean, he would have to name you. He'd have to name me because we are accomplices in... <laughs> his crime, you know, sin. And he would have to start saying, yeah, 
Jeff, Elizabeth. I mean, he, he couldn't do that. He was taking it all for our sins upon himself. That's why he didn't say a word. So every time they'd whip him, they'd bring the whip down harder and harder. So by the time they got done, 39 lashes times nine, do the math. That's a lot. I mean, it's just amazing what he endured. Like I said, many people would die just from the scourging because it, there's a lot of reports. You read history books and they'll say if they didn't confess anything, their, their um, ribs would be showing. They'd cut through the bone. Many times their internal organs would be showing and they would die. They'd bleed out. So they did this to Jesus. Amazing. Jesus remained silent. His back would have been totally shredded. According to John's gospel, Pilate brings him out and says, I find no fault in him. And yet they still continued to say, crucify him, crucify him. Here's Pontius Pilate's problem here. It says, I'm washing my hands. I'm innocent. He's washing his hands in front of all the people. You can't wash your hands and try to deal with Jesus. You can't try and cleanse yourself from your own sins. Pilate is just as guilty as the rest of us. You can't wash your hands and think this will take care of the problem. John chapter 1, verse 12, I'll close with this. It says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. That's the only way you're going to be made righteous. You can't wash your heart clean. You can't wash and make yourself holy. You can't try and make yourself righteous. You can't do it. All you can do is humble yourself before Jesus and let Jesus wash your heart clean. You can't wash your hands of him and say, ah, I'm not going to do anything, have anything to do with this guy. No, we're all guilty. We'll all stand before God at one point or another. But if you allow Jesus to come into your life, he will declare you righteous. He will make you holy. He'll wash you clean. All your sins will be removed. As far as the east is from the west, he'll remember them no more. Only Christ can do that for us. Don't try. Don't try harder to become good. Don't try to make yourself holy. You can't. You'll fall short every time because there's none righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So we'll stop here. Lord willing, we'll pick up in uh, verse 27 next time as Jesus goes to the cross. And we'll look at the seven things that Jesus says from the cross. It's amazing what he says while he's hanging on the cross, dying in our place.